Ezekiel chapter 8. In the sixth year, in the sixth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I sat in my house, and the elders of Judah sat before me, the Lord Yahweh's hand fell on me there. Then I saw, and behold, a likeness as the appearance of fire, from the appearance of his waist and downward, fire, and from his waist and upward, as the appearance of brightness, as it were, glowing metal. He stretched out the form of a hand, and took me by a lock of my head, and the Spirit lifted me up between earth and the sky, and brought me in visions of God to Jerusalem, to the door of the gate of the inner court that looks toward the north, where there was the seat of the image of jealousy, which provokes to jealousy. Behold, the glory of the God of Israel was there, according to the appearance that I saw in the plain. Then he said to me, Son of man, lift up your eyes now to the way, lift up your eyes now the way toward the north. So I lifted up my eyes the way toward the north, and saw, northward of the gate of the altar, this image of jealousy in the entry. He said to me, Son of man, do you see what they do? Even the great abominations that the house of Israel commit here, that I should go far off from my sanctuary? But you will again yet see other great abominations. He brought me to the door of the court, and when I looked, behold, a hole in the wall. Then he said to me, Son of man, dig now in the wall. When I had dug in the wall, I saw a door. He said to me, Go in and see the wicked abominations that they do there. So I went in and looked, and saw every form of creeping things, abominable things, and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed around on the wall. Seventy men of the elders of the house of Israel stood before them. In the middle of them, Jaazaniah the son of Shaphan, stood, every man with his censer in his hand, and the smell of the cloud of incense went up. Then he said to me, Son of man, have you seen what the elders of the house of Israel do in the dark, every man in his rooms of imagery? For they say, Yahweh doesn't see us. Yahweh has forsaken the land. He also said to me, you will again see more of the great abominations which they do. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of Yahweh's house, which was toward the north. And I saw the women sit there weeping for Tammuz. Then he said to me, Have you seen this, son of man? You will again yet see greater abominations than these. He brought me into the inner court of Yahweh's house, and I saw at the door of Yahweh's house between the porch and the altar there were about twenty-five men, with their backs toward Yahweh's temple and their faces toward the east, they were worshipping the sun toward the east. Then he said to me, Have you seen this, son of man? Is it a light thing to the house of Judah that they commit the abominations which they commit here? For, I, for they have filled the land with violence and have turned again to provoke me to anger. Behold, they put the branch to their nose. Therefore I will also deal in wrath. My eye won't spare, neither will I have pity. Though they cry in my ears with a loud voice, I will not hear them. Okay, so we're now in another complete um, visionary experience of Ezekiel. So he had a vision at the start with, you know, wheels in wheels and four living creatures and all of that was described in great detail in chapter one. Then he had a series of prophetic things he had to do. But now he've come, we have another vision. In this vision, he's lifted up and taken to Jerusalem. So he, he bodily is in Babylon, but spiritually he's in Jerusalem. He's, he's been taken to this other place in his experience. Like he's seeing Jerusalem, he's feeling Jerusalem, he's in Jerusalem, but he, he, he's not actually in Jerusalem. He's in still in Babylon. And so... Um, he has this experience of seeing what's going on in the temple. So he sees, first of all, this object of jealousy in the north gate. We don't know what that is, but something that made the Lord jealous, some kind of like false idol. The Lord says that there were worse things than that. So then the Lord shows him 70 elders burning incense in the temple. He goes in through a back door. One of the men there is called Jaazaniah, the son of Shaphan, it's interesting that he, um, he names this person because he's in a vision. It's, it's like he's describing something he's actually there. 
Well, that's a part of the authenticity of the vision because Ezekiel actually comes from Jerusalem. Like he was taken away in the second exile of Nebuchadnezzar and he's, he left Jerusalem, but no doubt he still remembers people. <laughs> so the Lord brings him back in a vision, but he recognizes someone in his vision. Oh, that's Jaazaniah, the son of Shaphan. Him and these seven, 70 others are burning incense to other gods, but in the temple. The Lord said, "The Lord's obviously not happy with that, but the Lord says there's even worse things. Then he shows them these women who are weeping for Tammuz. I looked that up. Tammuz was a Babylonian god. It's so weird. Like, um, Tammuz, it actually says here, was a Babylonian god, but had equivalent, I'm just reading my notes, had equivalent female gods in these other religious systems like the Egyptian and the Canaanite system. Later on, after they went to Babylon in exile, the Jewish calendar got given different names. So the Jews had their own calendar, um, but the calendar was renamed um, by their captors, and one of the months, the fourth month of the year, was, was the month of Tammuz. So even one of the months of the year was given the name of a Babylonian god, but they weren't even in Babylon yet. These women were weeping for Tammuz. So apparently there was this whole thing where once a year you would weep for this god. I looked it up, but I, I, I feel I should not describe to you what goes on with this whole process. But the, the idea of weeping for this god was a part of the way you would worship it. And the, there was a Jewish rabbi called Rabbi Rashi, and he had said that they that there was an idol which had some kind of candles or wax or something, and when they would light the candles, the wax would come out the eyes, and it would look like the idol was crying. So this idea of weeping, it's it was just connected with the worship of this god. So here's the Jewish women in the temple, but worshiping this Babylonian god. So they're worshiping the gods of the land they haven't even got to yet. Well, the Lord said that there was even worse abominations than that. And then he shows Ezekiel people standing in the temple, but facing the sun and worshipping the sun. That's an Egyptian thing. So they're in the temple. The Lord shows Ezekiel in a vision. He's taken there. He shows them him four different things in the temple. He shows them the object of jealousy, the burning of incense to other gods. He shows them the weeping for Tammuz and the worshipping of the sun. So they're worshipping all different types of religion and they're doing it all in the temple. So the Lord is really, really upset and he says he's going to deal with it in his wrath and not have pity. The Lord's really upset because it's happening in his temple. Now, have you ever, um, have you ever traveled or been anywhere and noticed you know, different forms of Christianity in different countries? I remember when I went to Haiti one of the most memorable experiences of my life, not for good reasons. And um, when I was in Haiti, um, I remembered someone saying, oh, the country's like 90% Catholic. Someone said that. A a another time I was talking to someone else and they said, oh, the country is 90% voodoo. voodoo. Voodooism is like an African religion where they like, oh, anyway, it's, it's a spiritistic type of a religion. It's not good. And I'm like, how can it be like, 90% voodoo and 90% Catholic, and they're like, oh, it's the same thing. What? How can those two things be the same thing? What it is, is it's called syncretism. It's where you mix different religions together. So, a lot of, it seems like a lot of people in Haiti have a kind of a Catholicism that's also a kind of an African religion, and they mix these together. It's like what we call syncretism. And um, everywhere the gospel has gone, um, this is often where it begins. You know, the gospel has an effect in bringing people to Christ, but there's a process where we have to leave behind. Um, our, we humans, we're weak. We often mix what we want to do in with what the Lord does. So it's a process over time to get ourselves all sorted out and proper. Well, this is, this is what happened, was happening in Israel is that they were mixing in Canaanite religion in with the worship of the Lord. They were doing it in the temple even, and it bothered the Lord a lot. So when we travel, you know, we notice it in other places. It's so obvious, oh, that's syncretism. But the thing is, we do it too. We just don't notice it when we do it. 
someone else would come to visit us and they would notice our sins, our syncretism. So we all have syncretism to a certain element. In other words, what we all do is we mix our worship of the Lord with our worship of other things. It's horrible to say it, but it's a little bit like all this worshipping that was going on in the temple. You know, they were worshipping the Lord, but worshipping other things as well. So what we tend to do is we have modern things that we worship. We let things get into our hearts and we prize them so greatly and we mix them into our way of life. So people might value, oh, making money, for example. And um, so, you know, God, money can be a god for some people, but some people mix it so into their spirituality that they think that worshipping God is making money or they think that work, that making money is a way of honouring God. Like, I'm not saying that's the case for everyone, but what I'm saying is that we all tend to syncretize a bit. What we should do is we should ask people around us, you know, you know how pure is my faith? You know, how do you think I'm going? You should ask yourself. You should sit with the Lord and ask the Lord to show you whatever syncretism there is in your heart. We all have a bit of it. The Lord is so gracious. In the case of the Israelites, the Lord had been speaking to them for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years and they didn't pay attention. But we all but but the example of it in the Bible is a grace to us. We often make the same mistakes, but the Lord so gently shows us that we're doing the same mistakes. I remember years ago realizing one day that there were four great things that every believer had to overcome. Um, it could be more or less, and it could be different for different people, but I, I thought to myself, there's really like four big things. There's um, the lack of prayer. You know, we, we just don't want to pray. Well, that's a type of putting yourself first. There's the love of money. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's another type of putting yourself first. There's the love of sexual things that are, you know, doing it a different way to what God wants. Uh, and the fourth is the love of what people think of us, people-pleasing. These are the four big things that we all have to overcome and do them the Lord's way. And what we tend to do is we tend to mix a little bit of them all into our lives in various ways. And we have to become, you know, we have to, to do things the Lord's way. But to do it, we need grace. And um, so that's what we're going to do right now, is ask for grace. Lord, we see this example of syncretism, the mixing of other gods into the worship of the Lord in the temple. And Lord, we're mindful that at times we mix things too. Lord, forgive us. But I pray you'd help us to not mix worldliness into our faith. Help us, Lord. Open it. Give us understanding. Show us in any way that we've done that. Help us to have pure hearts before our Lord. Amen.